Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the United States Naval Academy Men's Glee Club under the direction of Dr. Aaron Smith. Please welcome our distinguished guests to the stage, led by the chairman of the 50th Commemorative Committee for the City of Dallas, Mrs. Ruth Collins Altshuler. The Most Reverend Bishop, Kevin J. Farrell of the Catholic Diocese of Dallas. The Mayor of Dallas, the Honorable Mike Rawlings. David McCullough and Pastor Emeritus of the St. Luke's Community United Methodist Church, Zan W. Holmes, Jr. And now, we ask you to please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Dallas Police Department Honor Guard. Please remain standing for the National Anthem, performed by Monica Saldivar. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last beam. Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets rattled, the bombs bursting in, and gave proof through the night. That our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangle banner yet wave? Oh, the land of the free. Today's invocation is presented by the Most Reverend Bishop Kevin J. Farrell of the Catholic Diocese of Dallas. Almighty and ever faithful God, today we lift up our minds and hearts to you because you, Lord, have lifted us up from the horrible tragedy enacted in this place, from the cruel suffering that was born on this hill, from the shock and horror that gripped our nation, and from the years when we as citizens of this city suffered and were implicated by the guns shot by one man that killed a president in whom many of us had set our hopes 
and dreams for a better America. It was your abiding inspiration and active presence among us, Lord, that moved us ever forward despite the temptation only to lament and to be paralyzed by our grief. You turned our sorrow into a firm commitment to move forward. You turned our grief into a resolve to refashion our city to a place where life flourishes and true love abounds. You turned our devastation to a commitment to rebuild here the city of God, a city where all are welcomed, nurtured, and cared for. We rejoice with gratitude in all that you have caused to happen here in a place which was disgraced, scorned, and ruthlessly judged by ourselves and others. May you, Heavenly Father, continue to sustain us as we celebrate that the phoenix has risen from the ashes of violence, that hatred can be turned to harmony, that ignorance can see to understanding, that prejudice can lead to openness. Make us instruments of your peace and bearers of divine justice that always tempers instinct with mercy, that changes what appears to be defeat to the reality fed by providence that all will be well. Lord, may you walk always with us. May you inspire us as you once inspired President John Fitzgerald Kennedy to dream of a world that never was and to say, why not? May God bless the United States of America. And now, please welcome the mayor of Dallas, the Honorable Mike Rawlings. A new era dawned and another waned a half a century ago when hope and hatred collided right here in Dallas. We watched the nightmarish reality that in our front yard, our president had been taken from us, taken from his family, taken from the world. John Fitzgerald Kennedy's presidency, his life, and yes, his death, seemed to mythologically usher in the next 50 years. What ensued was five decades filled with other tragedies, turmoil, and great triumphs. We were all very young. Our lives, our hopes and dreams in front of us. Dallas was very young as well, barely a century old. And given the nature of youth, we all felt invincible. Well, it seems that we all grew up that day, city and citizens, and suddenly we had to step up to trying to live up to the challenges of the words and visions of a beloved president. Our collective hearts were broken. Like so many of us who were too young to fully comprehend, I remember being called into the school gymnasium, hearing the terrible news and told to go home. Stunned civic leaders at the trademark luncheon awaited a president who would never arrive. Crowds prayed outside Parkland Hospital. Traffic stopped in cities across the country as news spread from car to car. And the world grieved with us. Newspapers reported that flags were lowered to half-staff around the globe. Germans on both sides of the Berlin Wall placed lit candles in their windows. An eight-year-old Nigerian girl recited the entire inaugural address from memory as her father wept, just like the skies today. While the past 
is never in the past. This was a lifetime ago. Now, today, we the people of Dallas honor the life, legacy, and leadership of the man who called us to think not of our own interest, but of our country's. We give thanks for his life and his service. We offer condolences to his family, especially his daughter Caroline, on this difficult day. We pay tribute to an idealist without illusions who helped build a more just and equal world. We salute a commander-in-chief who stared down a nuclear threat to this country. We praise a writer who profiled true courage and modeled it himself. We applaud a visionary who created a core of young Americans to promote peace around the globe. We stand in awe of a dreamer who challenged us to literally reach for the moon, though he himself would not live to see us achieve that goal. Other goals were even tougher, have taken longer to reach, and we, the United States, still struggle towards some even as we speak, as do we here in Dallas. But we're fortified by the knowledge that we have always had big goals and big aspirations in this city, set by our founding fathers like John Neely Bryan and George Dealey, the namesake of this plaza, re-energized by Mayor Eric Johnson, the mayor who led Dallas in the post-assassination years. These five decades have seen us turn civic heartbreak into hard work. They've seen us go from youthful invincibility to existential vulnerability to greater maturity as a city and a community. On the one-year anniversary of the assassination of the, the late Rabbi Eli, Levi Olin of Temple Emmanuel, one of our sp city's greatest spiritual leaders gave voice to Dallas's communal pain unleashed on that day. Rabbi Olin said then, quote, contrary to the impassioned judgment of that horrible moment, the city is not guilty of the crime, but in those awesome days following the assassination, the most powerful searchlight man possesses was focused on this city. Every flaw, every raw spot, every wrinkle, and every uncleanness was put under a microscope and shown to the world. He continued, the city of rich palaces and tall towers of commerce were set amidst slums and hovels. As the powerful light shone upon it, the city, it was learned, had been inhospitable to honorable debate." End quote. Rabbi Olin captured the heartbreak and hurt the city felt he stated plainly the defects and failings that were laid bare before the entire world. But most important, he called for Dallas to use this tragedy to seek a true transformation. Look around today. I believe we have heeded that call. The people of this city have been filled with a sense of industry born of tragedy driven to improve the substance of Dallas, not just the image of it. Today, because of the hard work of many people, Dallas is a different city. I believe the new frontier did not end that day on our Texas frontier. And I hope that President Kennedy would be pleased with our humble efforts towards fulfilling our country's highest calling, that of providing the opportunity for all citizens to exercise those inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The city of Dallas will continue on that course. The man we remember today gave us a gift that will not be squandered. He and our city will forever be linked. In tragedy, yes, but out of that tragedy, an opportunity was granted to us the chance to learn how to face the future when it, it's the darkest and the most uncertain, 
how to hold high the torch even when the flame flickers and threatens to go out. As the people of Dallas did then, each of us will meet our oncoming challenges head on with courage, honoring, but not living in the past, and never, never flinching from the truth. We will meet the future with the same vigor, optimism, and unfailing sense of duty that our young president embodied. President Kennedy brought us that message. In his pocket, down that street on November 22nd, 1963. That message was to be delivered a few miles away in a speech to Dallas leaders following his parade. It was a speech he never got to make. But those unspoken words resonate far beyond the life of the man. To commemorate that day and those words, we are unveiling a memorial right here in this historic plaza. It is inscribed with the last lines of his undelivered speech and will serve as a reminder and a permanent monument to President Kennedy's memory. I leave you with those resonant words. We in this country, in this generation, are by destiny rather than choice the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of our power and our responsibility, that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, and that we may achieve in our time and for all time the ancient vision of peace on earth goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our cause must always underlie our strength. For as was written long ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in a moment of silence in honor of the life of John Fitzgerald Kennedy.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David McCullough. He spoke to us in that now distant time past with a vitality and sense of purpose such as we had never heard before. He was young to be president, but it didn't seem so if you were younger still. He was ambitious to make it a better world, and so were we. Let the world go forth, he said, that the torch has passed to a new generation of Americans. It was an exciting time. He talked of all that needed to be done, of so much that mattered, equal opportunity, unity of purpose, education, the life of the mind and the spirit, art, poetry, service to one's country, and the courage to move forward into the future, the cause of peace on earth. His was the inspiring summons to serve, to hard work and worthy accomplishment, a summons we long for. He was an optimist, and he said so. But there was nothing, no side-stepping reality in what he said, no resorting to stale old platitudes. He spoke to the point and with confidence. He knew words matter. His words changed lives. His words changed history. Rarely has a commander in chief addressed the nation with such command of language. Much that he said applies now no less than half a century ago and will continue, let us hope, to be taken to heart far into the future. Gone but not forgotten is the old expression for departed heroes. But if not forgotten, they are not gone. On this day especially, and at this place, let us listen again to some of what John F. Kennedy said. The new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises. It is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer the American people, but what I intend to ask them. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal, and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. The heart of the question is whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. We must educate our children as our most valuable resource. We must have trained people, many trained people, their finest talents brought to the keenest edge. We must have not only scientists, mathematicians, technicians, we must have people skilled in the humanities. I look forward to an America which will reward achievement in the arts as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. I look forward to an America which commands respect throughout the world, not only for its strength, but for its civilization. This country cannot afford to be materially rich and spiritually poor. Art is the great unifying and humanizing experience. The life of the arts, far from being an interruption, a distraction in the life of a nation, is very close to the center of a nation's purpose. And it is the test of the quality of a nation's civilization. I am certain that after the dust of centuries has passed over our cities, we too will be remembered not for our victories or defeats in battle or in politics, but for our contributions
to the human spirit. If more politicians knew poetry and more poets knew politics, I am convinced the world would be a little better place to live. When power leads men towards arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the areas of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of his existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses, for art establishes the basic human truth which must serve as the touchstone of our judgment. Together, let us explore the stars, conquer the deserts, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depths. Those who came before us made certain that this country, that the role, that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution the first waves of modern invention, the first waves of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be part of it. We set sail on this new sea because there is to be a new knowledge gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. The goal of a peaceful world is our guide for the present and our vision for the future. The quest is the greatest adventure of our century. We sometimes chafe at the burden of our obligations, the complexity of our decisions, the agony of our choices. But there is no comfort or security in evasion, no solution in abdications, no relief in irresponsibility. The problems of the world cannot be possibly solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by the obvious realities. We need men who can dream of things that never were and ask, why not? Those things that we talk about today which seem unreal, where so many people doubt that they can be done. The fact of the matter is it has been true all through our history, they will be done. Again and again, John Kennedy's words are fired with his love of life, his love of his country and its history. He read history, he wrote history, and he understood that history was not just about times past, but also about those who populate the present. Each new generation, as he liked to say, and that we too, and that we too, will be judged by history and that we owe it to those who went before, those who will follow, to measure up, and yes, even surpass the achievements of the past with what we accomplish and with the values we hold dear. He also knew from his reading and from experience that very little of consequence is ever accomplished alone but by joint effort. America has been a joint effort all down the years, and we must continue in that spirit. As he himself said,
For I can assure you that we love our country not for what it was, though it has always been great, not for what it is, though this we are of this we are deeply proud, but what it someday can, and through the efforts of us all, someday will be. As his campaign song said, he had high hopes, and so do we, and on we go. Closing prayer will be delivered by Pastor Emeritus of the St. Luke's Community United Methodist Church, 
Zan W. Holmes, Jr. Let us pray. O oh God, I hope in ages past and I hope for years to come. Send us forth to claim the brand new future that you continue to offer us beyond our tragedies and our triumphs. And as we go forth, grant that we may not be centered on where we have been or on what we have done, but on where we're going and what is possible by your grace for us to become a beloved community which celebrates and affirms our unity in the midst of our God-given diversity. And in the challenging words of a Franciscan benediction, may God bless us with discomforted easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace for all. And may God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do together what others claim cannot be done. And so in this season of Thanksgiving, we humbly ask these blessings in the name of the one God who created us all for the sake of a beloved community and in thanksgiving to God for the inspiring and courageous life and legacy of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand as we retire the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. We thank you for your attendance.